Hi everyone, this is Phil Travis, and this is, of course, U.S. History Part 2. Um, and this week is our last week. Uh, it's our final week, and I want you to use this week to really prepare for the final exam. Don't forget, you can still submit that third paper. If you have not done a paper yet in this class, you need to do that third paper. If you don't, it's going to be like zero for 20% of your grade. And of course, if you didn't do well in the one paper you did, you can do the third paper, and it's of no consequence. Like, I will drop the lowest score, so you're only going to have the highest score kept. But please make sure that if you haven't done a paper, please make sure that you do um, do a paper. Make sure you submit that third paper if you haven't uh, submitted a paper uh, yet. Um, be sure we use this week to prepare for the test. I have a very, our, our discussion form this week is limited. Um, there's no quiz or anything. I just want you to use that study guide, prepare for the test. And um, and I have a very brief uh, discussion forum activity. Um, I basically want to hear you. I want to hear your thoughts about how you think uh, the sort of polarization of American politics and society today could or could not be related to some of the issues that we've studied and learned about in this class. And there's no right or wrong answer. Just remember to always be respectful, of, you know, because... Politics is very polarizing right now. It's very important that we consider, um, <clears throat> you know, what we state and how we respond. Um, you know, be very cautious of the, you know, the of the sentiments of other people because, um, you know, there's a lot of um, current sort of um, a lot of emotions tied to current political situations in the United States. Um, the United States has been pretty politically polarized for. Um, uh, some time now, uh, preceding the last election, by the way. Um, the United States was pretty polarized um, throughout uh, the 21st century, I think you could say. And actually, you know, as we study the Gilded Age, and this is going to be the factoid for this week, um, you know, there's, there's certain similarities. And if you remember the beginning of this class, we were talking about the Gilded Age, um, and we were talking about um, industrial monopolies and wealth inequality, and there have been some historians, some very noteworthy historians, uh, like Doris Kearns Goodwin, for example, who was the author um, of the book Lincoln that became the movie. Um, she's also, I believe, the, the, the author of the, of the books on the, Rose of, on the Roosevelts that, of course, became a PBS documentary. Um, I believe so, though I'm not, that's riffing off the top of my head, so I could be wrong about that. But Doris Kearns Goodwin is a, um, you know, one of the most famous American historians in the United States. She's interviewed on television with some frequency, and she has described this era as like the second Gilded Age, an era in which there seems to be a sort of inside association between business interests and lobbyists and the government, and that there is there are certain factors um, in the country that are, are very concerning in terms of the expansion of, if you will, pseudo-monopolies in the American economy, an explosion of wealth inequality where you've produced a very significant amount of millionaires in the last, since the 1980s really, uh, while simultaneously the middle class has been increasingly strapped with debt and squeezed and the bottom uh, sector, the working class sectors of society um, have, found them, have found their wages as well as the middle class stagnate. Uh, we've had rising debt, stagnating wages, raising cost of living, and these have played into the development of, of a pretty significant crisis of, of wealth inequality in the United States. That has led some scholars to refer to this era as uh, almost like a second Gilded Age, an era in which seemingly large lobbyists and business interests seem to have sway over the government. Um, over the best interests, perhaps, of the public good, the society as a whole. Um, so some historians have made the suggestions. And here's the factoid. Relating to that, the 21st century is actually associated with some of the closest elections um, since the Gilded Age. Um, the election of George W. Bush over Al Gore was the case of an election in which the winner um, did not receive, did not win the popular vote. And of course, the 2016 election in which uh, Donald Trump defeated Hillary Clinton was another case where the individual selected for the presidency had not also won the popular vote. 
So those are two very, very close elections. 20, uh, 2000 and 2016 are two very close elections in which the individual who became president became president as a result of the Electoral College. Um, they did not win the popular vote. They won on the basis of the electoral votes of states. You have to go back to the Gilded Age to find another time in which there were two elections um, in a short period of time in which the individual who won the presidency did not also carry the popular vote. Um, and the examples in the Gilded Age are the 1876 election in which Rutherford B. Hayes was basically chosen by a House committee due to disputed ballots from a number of different states. Um, Rutherford B. Hayes assumed the presidency um, in a very tightly contested election. And of course, Benjamin Harrison, who became president, who was elected president in 1888, um, also became um, a president without the popular vote through the Electoral College. Associated with Benjamin Harrison, too, was the election of what they called the Million Dollar Congress. So the factoid for this week, and that was a reference to the emergence of a, a really a, a spike in corporate involvement in funding and paying for elections. And that's another thing that, that individuals might say is a you know commonality between the Gilded Age and the present day in the sense that today with certain Supreme Court decisions, um, campaign funding has been really opened up and effectively, um, you know, the candidates who run for high office receive a tremendous amount of money, uh, many of which comes from large um, corporate donors or funding from, um, you know, market interests in these types of things. And so this, this kind of political reality, a polarized era in American uh, history of the 21st century shares some similarities with the Gilded Age. And one of those similarities is in these um, tightly contested elections in which the, uh, the individual assuming office has not um, always carried the popular vote. So the factoid for this week is that, um, that the 21st century shares the association with the Gilded Age in the sense that, like the Gilded Age, in the 21st century we've witnessed within 16 years two presidential elections in which the individual assuming office did not win the popular vote. In the Gilded Age, I believe it was 12 years uh, between the two elections in which the individual assuming office um, was not overwhelmingly the popular uh, winner. So that's the factoid for this week. Uh, just summarize it. Uh, just give me the gist of it. It's fine. Um, you're not going to, you know, I just want to make sure you're watching these. And this is an easy week. And the discussion forum will be a little lighter in terms of requirements. And I want everybody to be preparing for the last test, uh, which we have coming up. So make sure you study, use the study guide, and do as well as you can on that. And if you haven't done a paper, make sure you turn in the third paper um, so you, you don't hurt your grade unnecessarily. And I hope everyone's had a great term. I've really enjoyed having uh, you in this class. I think we've had some fun discussions, and I hope these announcements and the video lectures and so forth have also been, um, have also been you know, uh, you know, helpful in terms of learning. So uh, let's have a great week, and uh, hopefully I'll see some of you back in another class again.